Today I want to share the word with you, and hopefully uh, I'm going to try to stay as close to the program as possible. And that means I may go really fast, or that may mean nothing at all. Uh, I don't know. But I'm glad to be in God's house with God's people to give God praise. Because I know that God reigns. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to be preaching a, a sermon that's kind of two-phased this morning. One, our God reigns. And two, in His presence. Something marvelous happens in the presence of God. And some of you need to learn to get in God's presence. With everything that we got going on in the world today, I am so glad. And it brings me great peace to know that our God still reigns. Amen? God is in charge on the earth. The devil just thinks he is. But God really is. Isaiah chapter 40. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Listen to me. God sits on the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who had created these heavenly bodies. Talking about the stars. The one who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of his greatness, of his might and strength, of his power, not one, not one star is missing. Now, if you study the stars, this is what that really means right there. This is what we know from science. It is reported that there are 40 sextillion stars. That is the number 40 with with 21 zeros. Webster's Dictionary has 500,000 English words. And if we were to replace those 500 words with just the names of the stars, just the names of the stars, we would need 80 quadrillion books. Or 80 was 16 zeros. And yet the prophet says, God knows every one of them by name. And if he knows all of the stars of heaven by their name, don't you know that he knows your name? He is the God who reigns above the earth. He is the God who is in charge of all that is going on. We act like he's not in charge. We act like we're afraid to death to go anywhere or to do anything or to be anybody. We need to know who reigns over the earth. His name is Emmanuel. God is with us. And we need to know him in the power of his might. If he can keep up with with 40 sextillion stars, surely he's not going to lose one of you. He didn't give his son to die for a star, but he gave his son to die for you. Let me tell you, he puts importance on who you are. We live and breathe and have our being because of him. He has placed us in his body as it pleases him. Some of you need to get happy where you are. Some of you need to find the joy of the Lord. Some of you need to quit drinking that pickle juice. Some of you need to start drinking that joy juice. Amen. Amen. I would definitely say that the Lord God reigns. Psalms 24, 1. And we're going to shift gears after this. Psalms 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's. Listen to me. This globe that you and I sit on, have our being on, belongs to him. And all of his fullness and everybody that lives here belongs to him. I want to change gears now. I believe you understand that God reigns. But I want to talk about in his presence. In the presence of God, something wonderful happens. The problem is the church does not get in his presence enough. Psalm 1611 says this. You're going to have to sit down back there and go, buddy. I'm going quick. 
You will show me the path of life in your presence is the fullness of joy. When you get in the presence of God, you will begin to discover the fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God says you will never be any happier than when you're in God's presence. You can't get any happier anywhere else on the planet except in his presence. And the devil does all he can to keep us out of the presence of God. I don't know why we don't seek his presence more. Acts 3.19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the refreshings may come You want to be refreshed after a pandemic? You want to be refreshed after your sickness? You want to be refreshed after you're going through a hard time? Find the presence of God and you'll get refreshed. You need to get in his presence. We do all we can to stay out of his presence. But we need to do all we can to get in his presence because in his presence, we are refreshed. When you get in worship and get in his presence, he will refresh your soul and bring you back and give you great joy so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of God. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. This is a, a wonderful scripture. Now, you got a picture. Isaiah was having a very hard day when he wrote this. Israel was having a hard day when he wrote this. Isaiah is going through a tough time, and he has an encounter with God. Don't you know when you're going through a tough place, you need to get an encounter. Hallelujah. You need to get an encounter with God. When you're going through a hard place, you need to find the presence of God. Get in the middle of God. Get a refreshing from God and let his presence begin to do something for you. Isaiah's going through a a difficult time because the Bible said the king had died. Isaiah goes into the temple and sees the Lord. When he comes into the presence of God, he sees God in a new way. How many of you need to see God in a new way? The way that he saw God this time when he went into his presence was that the impossible can come possible. When we see the Lord God Almighty, the impossible in our life becomes possible. Lionel told a story of having no food. And giving your last dollar. My wife and I, when we pastored a little church in Aberdeen, we were in a position, we were at a convention 80 miles from home, and we were driving a 66 Caprice. Does anybody know what a 66 Caprice looks like? If you park it in this building, the nose would be here, and the trunk would be there. You never passed a gas station with a Caprice. Not a 66 with a 40 in it, with over a 4 in it. You did not pass a gas station. You could pass everything else, but not a gas station. We were in a convention, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to give every penny of money you have. I only had $12. He wouldn't have, but that's been 40 years ago. I told my wife, the Lord just spoke to me and said, give everything. She said, well, give everything. While I am giving my offering, the preacher on the stage, the Holy Spirit is telling the preacher, I want you to give Frank Smith $25. I gave the 12, and before I left the building, I had 25. Let me tell you, when you get in the presence of God, you can hear some things. The impossible become possible. You just need to know how to listen to the God of heaven. I've discovered three things when you get in the presence of God happens to you. You ought to write these down. Number one, you see how big God is. When we are in his presence, no longer is God small. Isaiah said his train. Let me read it to you. In the year that King Uzziah died, you want to keep that in mind because that's very important in Isaiah's day, in the year that the king died. We don't even know who Uzziah is most of the time. I I saw the Lord. 
I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. The king is dead, but the big king with the big G and the big K is sitting on the throne. The little king with the little G has died, but the big king with the big K is still on the throne. Somebody needs to know that the king with the big K is still on the throne this morning. I saw him high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood a seraphim. That means many angels. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. Come on, somebody. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house, somebody help me, was filled with smoke, his presence. What had happened in Israel was, at that time, King Uzziah had died. Most of us know the great kings of the Bible. We know David and Solomon and some of the others, but we don't know who Uzziah is. Uzziah was a great king for Israel. He served uh, 52 years, and he started when he was 16 years old. And the very first thing that he did was he began to restore the house of God and he restored worship in Israel because he knew that if you will worship God, there will be a presence that will come among you. Now, what did that mean for the kingdom? What it meant was, that he conquered many Philistine cities, he expanded the kingdom of Israel, and he brought prosperity to all the people. Because he did the act of restoring worship, restoring the presence of God that Israel had run off. Let me tell you, just because we go to church does not mean that the presence of God is in that church with us. How many of y'all have ever been in a service that's dry as a bone? Yeah, I can't stay around those much. I need the presence of God because in the presence of God, there is life. In the presence of God, there's wonderful things. He conquered Philistine cities. He expanded the kingdom. He brought prosperity to all the people. But something happened. The Bible says that he was blessed until he became strong. And that's where some of us are. When we get, get a little strong, we get full of ourselves. This is what's happened. In the last years before Uzziah's death, The king of Assyria goes out and he's on a rampage and he's attacking everybody around except Israel. And the reason he will not go to Israel is because King Uzziah is the king. Let me tell you, the devil is rampaging, but he will not come near your house if Jesus is your king. The only reason that the king of Syria wouldn't go to Israel is because Uzziah was king. And Uzziah had a reputation of being bad to the bone. You attack Uzziah, Uzziah will attack you back. And the problem is, and the situation is, Uzziah will whip you. Because he had whipped every Philistine there was around. But somehow and for some reason, this king got all upset. And he started attacking in every direction. But when he came to Israel, he passed over. Wouldn't it be wonderful in the presence of God that when the devil comes to your house, he goes the other direction and says, I won't attack that house because King Jesus is alive and well at that house. King Uzziah kept a whole lot of people from attacking Israel simply by his reputation. So when King Uzziah dies, the whole nation is scared. They are scared to death because they understand what Uzziah means to Israel. Now, God helped King Uzziah in a wonderful way. I mean, we read about the weapons of war that King Uzziah started. If you want to, let me, he, how many have ever heard the word catapult? Do you know that King Uzziah is the guy that invented that? Let me show you. Second Chronicles 26, 14 and 15. Then Uzziah prepared for them, for the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stones. He developed the catapult. 
that they used well, well into the 16th and 18th, all, all the way up. Listen, invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide. We are not attacking Israel. King Uzziah is on the throne. You know what? We need to send out a message that King Jesus is on the throne of our life. Let me tell you, wasn't no Philistine coming to to Israel to attack them when King Uzziah was alive. They just wouldn't do it. They wouldn't even go near the border because they understood what would happen. Because God gave that man such skill, he developed all kind of stuff. Listen, so his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped. Look at that last phrase. Till he got too big for himself. Till he became strong. That's how we are sometimes. We go and go, and when God is blessing us, man, we don't need to keep up with all that spiritual stuff anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm doing wonderful in the presence of God. I'm doing great. And that's what Israel said. And that's what King Uzziah said. Now, King Uzziah, the sad part is that King Uzziah became puffed up with pride at the end of his life. He got so puffed up that he went to the temple to offer sacrifices, something that he was not allowed to do. And so when he went in there, the priest ran in and said, Hey, you cannot do this. You cannot offer that. And he said, I am the king. I can do what I want to do. He began to believe his own press. You know what happened to him? Immediately, the Bible said he was struck down with leprosy and spent the rest of his natural life isolated from the house of God and his natural family. Wow. When you get in the presence of God, you see how big God is. Things are rough in Israel at this time, and the people are afraid. So Isaiah goes to the temple and gets a revelation from God and comes out, and this is what King, uh, this is what Isaiah said. He said, the king with the little g is dead, but the king with the, um, with the big K is dead, or little K is dead, but the king with the big K is still on the throne. Every one of us needs a revelation of how big God is. And it happens when we come together in his presence. The devil knows this and he will do everything he can to keep us out of the presence of God. If we are not careful, Satan will always keep us in a state of selfishness, pride, and the list can go on. He does not want you in the presence of God because he knows in the presence of God you will get revelation. It is important for us to gather together in God's house to worship him and not just hear the sermon. The message is important, but many times we think about hearing the speaker, but we need to be concerned about hearing the Savior. Hear me, church. We may think it's okay to come to church late and say, well, I'm just missing the singing part. I just want to get to the message. That's no big deal. It is a big deal. The worship is extremely important because it is where God wants to meet with his people. Exodus, give these next scriptures in quick succession. Exodus 35, 18, Hebrews, and Psalms and Psalms. The pegs of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court, and the, and the cords. Go ahead. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as... A, As the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Psalms 22. My praise shall be, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. Assembly is wonderful. Getting together in God's house is wonderful. It is commanded and we must do it. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. It is important in these last days that we get in the house. There is a difference between being in service and watching a service online. So many today say, I don't need to go to church. I can watch church anytime I want to. There is a difference. If you you can't be in service, by all means, watch it online. But if you can be in service, you need to be in service. And here's why. God does something when when we gather If attending church was not important, I got a question for you. Why does the devil fight every Sunday morning? Why is it that you can get up five days a week and go to work and be on time every day? 
Why is that? But on Sunday morning when you get up to go to church, it seems like everything under the sun goes wrong. You got a flat. You can't find your kids. I mean, (laughs) they're where you left them. Go to grandma's and get them. And then when you do get here, you can't worship because you've had to fight with your wife and had to spank three kids from the front seat. Everything that can go wrong goes wrong on Sunday morning. Monday through Friday, no problem. I can be to work at 6 a.m., but I can't get to church at 11. Because the devil fights it. Why does he fight it? Because he knows when you assemble together in the presence of God, God is going to reveal something to you. Revelation comes in the presence of God. Satan does everything he can to keep you from gathering because he knows when you get in God's presence, you're going to discover how big God is in your life. And you're going to stop letting the devil push you around with all the things and the inks and the little demons that run around in our lives that we need to just push out and quit dealing with. Number two, we learn how small we are. I don't mean insignificant. I mean small. There's a difference. God would never send his son to die for someone who was insignificant. You're not insignificant. You're very significant to God. Every one of you are important. If he, if he knows the name of that many stars, 40 sextillion stars, then he knows your name. You're significant. But compared to God, we are very small. And our problems are very small. Look up here at me, everybody. Our problems are very small. They don't seem small, but they are small. They are small. They're small, and this is why. Because God can stop every problem in your life. But you haven't been convinced by God yet that he can do that. But when you get in God's presence, something marvelous happens. Revelation begins to happen to you. Let's look what happened in Isaiah 6 and 5. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Now, this is Isaiah standing in the presence of God, and he sees just how small he is. He said, I I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I will dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Give me the next verse. The word host there means the host of the kings of God. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted the following verse on that one, but that's okay. The next verse says that he took tongues and fire off the altar and purged his lips with it. The, the word host there means a host of heaven. That's what, in 2 Kings, that's what Elijah's servant saw. Let's read that. Okay, let me read this. Go back. <laughs> Go back, Tony. Go forward one more. There we are. Then one of the seraphim, angels, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Give me the next, seven. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. And your sin is purged. In the presence of God, something wonderful happens. You find out how big God is and how small you are. And when you get in the presence of God, God begins to reveal your sin to you. When Isaiah, who was a prophet, got in the presence of God, God began to tell Isaiah, Hey, you are a man of unclean lips. And you dwell a bunch among a bunch of people who have unclean lips. But I got a solution for that. I got a solution for that. I will take the coals off of the altar and I will place them on your lips and I will purge you and all of your sins will go away. Uzziah, their commander-in-chief, had just died, but Isaiah said, I see the great commander, the one who commands all of heaven. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open the eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of the horsemen and the chariots of fire all around Elijah. How small we are in the presence of God. The enemy was raging, but Elijah was not afraid. He was not afraid because the host of heaven was encamped about him. In the presence of God, you find out how big God is, how small you are. Give me a couple more minutes and I'll finish here this this morning.
We may be in some tough times, but our great commander is still in charge on the earth. And we belong to him. Everybody that lives on the earth is still under his authority. Whether we like it or not. Isaiah sees how big God is and how small he is. Here's what happens in the presence of God. We see our sin. That's not a bad thing because Jesus has dealt with our sin on the cross. Isaiah said, woe is me from a man of unclean lips. In the presence of God, he was purged and made clean. When you're gathering in the house of God, in the worship service of God, and the presence of God is moving, and he comes to you and reveals sin to you, right there on that spot, in that position, with nobody praying with you, except you and God in his presence, instantly he brings something and purges your sin. Why does he do that? Because when you get saved, you're not perfect. We live a life of sanctification which is progressive. And instantaneous. We go from glory to glory. And as we do that, when we come into the presence of God, God may say to you, you have a sin of pride, selfishness, greed. You talk too much. You gossip. You bring disunity. He might tell you a lot of things in his presence. But he doesn't do that to make you feel bad. God never reveals any sin to us to make us feel bad. He reveals sin to us so that we can deal with the sin that's in our life. So that as we deal with the sin that's in our life, we become more like he is. And as we become more like he is, we are getting ready for the place he's prepared for us. But you you can't go to heaven if you hold on to all your own sin and anxiety and all the fussing and carrying on that we allow to be in our lives. We can't go to heaven. It wouldn't, it's not prepared for those people. Heaven wasn't prepared for that. Heaven was prepared for, for those, for the righteous. God purges us in his presence. God never shows us our sins to make us feel bad. He does it. Look at, look at Psalm 1611, what he does with it. Psalm 1611. Psalms, there we go. You will show me the path of life, and your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand and our pleasures forevermore. Isn't that what all of us are wanting to find here? He also tells us that he takes our sins and he casts them as far as the east is from the west. In his presence, he does that with our sin. In his presence, he begins to speak to us about the sin in our life. It, I don't know what sin could be in your life in this room with me today, but I promise you there's some of us in here, probably be all of us that need to stand in his presence and let him begin to reveal to us the sin that's in our life so that we can really be free. Do you think God wants you to go around being fearful? Do you think he wants you to go around being worried about what the future holds? People are scared to death about what's going to happen to the earth. Let me break it down for you. It's going to be destroyed. Nothing you can do and all the wearing you can come up with is not going to change that fact. But the, that's the bad news. The good news is I won't be here. And the good news is you won't either. If you know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, you will not be here. When you see, when you see how holy God is, you see how needy that you are. Revelation 4.8 is a counterpart to Isaiah. Let's read Revelation 4.8. Then the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Did you know that that's the only attribute of God that is repeated three times? Holy, holy, holy. Now, you don't, hear, you don't read in Scripture where it says he's faithful, 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 but he is faithful. Or where he's loving, 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 but he is loving. But you hear in Scripture, in the Old and the New Testament, holy, holy, holy. Now, this is what scholars believe. They believe that one holy was not enough. And that's their explanation. They don't give any other. One holy just wasn't enough to cover him. One holy was just not enough. Think about it. Everything God touches becomes holy. His word is holy. His people are holy. His spirit is holy. His tithe is holy. His name is holy. His temple is holy. His angels are holy. Have y'all read that in Scripture too? Psalms 22, 3 through 5. 
But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. Where does God live? In your praise. In your praise. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and you were delivered. Listen to that verse. They trusted in you. Can you trust God today with your life? If you can trust him, he, can, he will deliver you. They cried to you and, you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Let me tell you, God wants to help us. God is holy, but one of the places that he lives is in our praise. When people come together and praise him, it is that place that he meets with them. Number three in closing, we see how good God is when we get in his presence. We see how good he is. Isaiah, I've already read this scripture, but Isaiah 6 and 7 tells us how good he is. When you get in his presence, he comes on the scene and he begins to take things out of your life. He begins to remove those things that you've had for years. Now, you think you see people that's got gray hair, they don't have problems. They do. I've been a men's director for a long time. And you know the number one thing that you deal with in men's retreat a lot of times? is pornography. Young men, middle-aged men, and old men. But until you get in the presence of God, you don't get that take stuff taken out of you. You keep going around the circle. You find your 14 buddies that will call you every day and ask you. I have never believed in this in my life. I need you to call me in the morning to find out if I've been good. Does that make sense to anybody? Not to me. I don't need you to do that. What I need to do is get in the presence of God so I can be delivered. So that he can take the fire off of the altar and touch it to my lips and purge me. And all of my iniquity can be taken away from me. Not so that I can coexist and have somebody call me. If you need somebody to call you, I'm not going to be the one. I'm just saying. I'm not going to be that guy that calls you every morning and asks you, have you been good? I'm not that guy. But if you want to be delivered and find the presence of God, I am that guy. Because we can go there and we can, we can be free forever and forever and forever. When we are in his presence, he reveals the things in our heart and in our life that displeases him. How many of you in here this morning, without a show of, do not raise your hands, but you think you're walking perfect before God? You know what that means? That means you might need to get in his presence once more. When we are in his presence, he reveals the sins or the things in our life that displease him. And when we repent and tell God we do not want to do these things anymore, this is the result. Psalms 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So that pornography you dealt with, it don't even exist in, the, in this planet anymore. That anxiety you dealt with doesn't even exist in, on this planet anymore. It's as far as the east is from the west. We have not measured that space yet because we cannot measure that. It is gone. When you get in his presence, something happens. You discover how big God is, how small you are, and how wonderful God is. God is not in heaven with a big stick wanting to beat your brains out. He's in heaven wanting you to worship him so he can deliver you. He did make some parameters for receiving that, and that is some of the parameters that he has reached and that he's done. God is good. Stand to your feet with me for just a few minutes. Chris, can you give me just a minute of music here? For a minute, I want us to ask God what he wants us to do this year for his kingdom. I want us to ask God, how can, can I serve you? And as he plays a little music, I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to stand in the presence of God today, and I want you to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you things in your life that he is displeased with. Everybody look up here. Things in your life that he is displeased with. You might ask, does God really care? Yes, he cares. He cares about every weight and sin that you carry. Everything that goes on in your life that brings you displeasure that brings you pain and anxiety and fear he cares about that everything he cares if you have pride he cares if you have selfishness he cares if you have jealousy or envy or strife he cares if he cares if you have fearfulness he cares about all of those things 
Everything in our life that displeases God, he cares about. And he says this, if you'll just get in my presence, I will go to the altar and I will take a live coal and I will touch it to your lips and I will purge you. Did you guys do your homework that I gave you last week? Write down every time. <laughs> New Horizons knows what I'm talking about. If you want to pray this morning, I just want you to lift your hands and let's go to the Lord for just a minute and pray. Father, we are mindful of all that you do for us. We are mindful, God, that you're sovereign over all the world. We are mindful, God, that nothing is impossible for you. And Lord, we thank you today. And God, as we stand in your presence, as we stand here in your presence today, God, we ask you that you would reveal to us. If you need to come to the altar and pray, come. We ask you to reveal to us those things in our life that displeases you. Those sins that we carry around and that are always there like an albatross. God, everything that we do not and have not got free from. Lord, as I stand in your presence, I realize that my walk with you is from earth to glory. It is from year, dash, and year. Lord, I'm living the dash. And God, as I live this dash from when I was born until when you take me, I realize that I'm on a journey. And Lord, as I go through life, I pick up things that are displeasing to you. But today, as I stand here in your presence, reveal to me what they are so that I can confess them to you today. Now, what I want you to do right now is I want you to confess to God. And it might look like this, God, in my life, I have. And then you say what you have. I deal with pornography. I deal with anger. I deal with bitterness. I deal with unforgiveness. I can't name it all, but you know what you need. God, I need this. I stand here and I let you purge me. As I confess that to you, you are just to grab the fire off the altar and to touch me that all of my iniquity is forgiven and then all of my sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Father, we thank you today and we praise you today. We give honor to you this morning. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Is there one here this morning that would just raise your hand and say, I need prayer. I need prayer. You, you don't have to come up here. Just raise your hand and say, I need you to pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I see those hands going up. I ask you, Lord, that you would touch them. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them and keep your hand upon them. Lord, you would bring the deliverance in their life that they need. And Father God, for that, we will be careful to praise you and to give honor to you. Lord, we love you today. We thank you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen.